Hi, thanks, Kate. Definitely the north of England, I would say. Uh, coming from the south of England, this is quite far north. So obviously it has an influence on the um, the type of plants that we can grow in the gardens and the, and the type of fruit we certainly grow. But also what really influences our gardens particularly are the family. So um, currently Chatsworth is, is unusual in the respect that it has a family that still live here after 470 years. It's the same family continuum, but it's also a garden that's open to the public. So these are, these are the current residents. This is the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. They're the 17th generation of the Cavendish family to live at Chatsworth. And they've always been as a, as a, a quite a wealthy, um, empowered British family. They've had um, always been the head of fashions and they've always had quite a lot of wealth in order to um, luster on, on, on the gardens. And they've been very keen on the gardens and landscape since this, um, since they took up residence in the late 15, not, uh, 40s. So this is the, uh, the original house. Uh, the original owner was a lady called Bess of Hardwick from a local farming family who knew the estate well. She knew the climate very well, um, married very well, and happened to purchase this, this property around about, so the house, the gardens and the landscape we look after today is around about a thousand hectares, but the actual entire estate is, um, is close to 20,000 hectares. So it's quite a, quite a big estate spread across the North of England. She purchased this in 1540 with her, with her husband, and set about managing the landscape in a new way. And what we what we can see from these pictures, so I just put a highlight pen on. Is uh, this is the original garden? The ornamental section of it was very small in compared compared to the productive area. So all of this area here is production garden. And if we look at the lower picture, you can see this was actually an orchard more than likely for raw fruit. It was the Tudor period, so there was coming out cooked fruit into raw fruit, but also the, um, the production garden extended into this area, which was a series of ponds and other um, vegetable and fruit produce. If we then jump forward through the successive dukes and duchesses, so this is from, that was 1550 before, um, the upper picture is in the late 17th, early 18th century, um, the first joke we can see in red, an orchard, an ornamental orchard. The gardens were very formal. The fish ponds from the original garden are still outside. So there is still a big productive garden, but there is an internalized fruit garden in, in, um, in use, very ornamented. Um, however, as fashions changed, uh, we come forward to the 1730s, 1740s, and this was the start of the English landscape movement when they were starting to naturalize the garden space and do away with some of the working elements. The fruit garden has now been moved outside of the garden wall in this area in red. And by the time we get to the 1760s, so this is in a very short space of time, actually there is no productive garden in the landscape whatsoever. Nothing can be seen from the house. But in fact, we have records to show that uh, at this time in the in the late 1750s, early 1760s, the estate produced 330,000 bricks, which went into a walled garden, 12 acres, of about five and a half hectares, um, which was situated somewhere in, uh, well, we know where it was. It was about three quarters of a kilometre away from the house out of view. We don't have any records, however, of what was inside how, how they manage fruit, but we assume, or we can only assume that a family at this level of, of the English establishment would have been leading the fashions on the produce that they were growing. However, what we do have is we step forward into the 19th century. This is the, um, sorry about that, uh, 19th century. So this is the sixth Duke at this stage and his head gardener, Joseph Paxton, um, 1820s, 1826, he actually started at the house. The records started to become more complete, and this was this was a duke that had a lot of a lot of money, and he was a bachelor, so a lot of time to really focus his time on Derbyshire and the estates, and he built this section of uh, of the house, which was twice the size of the original mansion, purely for entertaining. So at that point, 
we have a lot of records to suggest that he was needing a lot of food and a lot of produce and had a big team of gardeners in order to be able to produce it. So this is, this is the wall garden that I talked about with the 330,000 bricks, but this is a photograph from the Victorian period. We don't know if these internal walls were part of the original garden or part of this new garden with the Sixth Duke and Joseph Paxton as head. But what we can see is that um, greenhouse technology was being exploited to its best. Um, so it, they had a lot of money and Paxton was quite an engineer. So there was over 20 um, houses for primarily for fruit in this um, in this garden. Although this 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 was a lily lily pond, which we may talk about later on. But these internal walls, you can see that they'd already started to have. And, and if we think about size, probably. 17 15 to 17 foot sort of high walls trained fruit being or the walls being used for for trained fruit definitely and we know from other records that they were feeding and entertaining many 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 people in fact there was a, a 80 000 visitors to chatsworth a year during that period so so a lot of people coming through and then rather than um all of the productive areas been having been removed by Capability Brown and, and the Fourth Duke outside of the gardens, Paxton and the Sixth Duke started to bring some of these productive areas back inside the gardens. So this is an image of, um, of a Victorian greenhouse built in 1840, finished in 1850 actually, because originally it was a covered walkway with a heated back wall for growing tender fruits against. Um, the windows, the glazed areas were put in 1850 because of our harsh winters were starting to damage the fruits from, they had originally had canvas coverings. Um, so so this is this is original, although it's a heavy maintenance bill, we, we do replace a lot of this annually, but this is an original Victorian structure that's still in the gardens today. And we, we manage it in a similar way. So we use the wall for growing um, tender fruits on primarily G, um, from the genus Prunus. But Ian will talk more about that in a second. So Paxton and Sixth Duke brings um, fruit production into back into the gardens, with also a wonderful other collection of plants and greenhouse technologies. This was a, an acre um, greenhouse that he built called the Great Conservatory, which was world leading in its day and using modern technology of large glass panes and bridge and furrow. Um, um, construction in order to get maximum penetration of light to the inside of the glass house with very limited internal supports and so they could grow a, a, a range of plants that were being collected from all around the world including for us one of our it's not a it's not a trained fruit but it's a really important fruit for Chatsworth which was the dwarf Cavendish banana and this is where Joseph Paxton managed to get it to flower with fruit and got his silver medal from the RHS. So we still think of fruit and the way that we manage the gardens today being sent around some of these historical events. And then unfortunately, and I think this is this, this sort of represents some of, some of the way fruit decline happened. Um, in the first, first World War, um, there was a limit in manpower and coal and heat in a greenhouse became very expensive. And so in the early 1920s, Paxton's great achievement with this glass house was, was demolished. And with it, um, yeah, a big legacy, but also it was the start of the family, the Cavendish family, changing Derbyshire as being their main residence to smaller residences uh, in and around London. And consequently, the need to grow fruits and vegetables in this area declined too. So we had very little from this uh, sort of 100 year ago period, we had very little in the gardens in terms of old ancient trained fruit until now actually so this is a this is a Paxton construction <clears throat> originally built as an, an orchid house in 1834 it was one of three orchid houses and about 100 years ago so it's a similar sort of time 90, 90 years ago actually a similar sort of time to the when the great conservatory was being demolished this small greenhouse was actually planted with with a vine and I'm going to hand over now to Ian because Ian's the lead gardener that manages this area and we'll give you a, 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 an introduction to how, how we looks off. Uh, hi there. Uh, okay so as, uh, as Mick um, just said this was an original Paxton greenhouse 
and uh, the and uh, once was the East India Orchid House. And these uh, orchids have obviously been uh, rehomed in different greenhouses. And for the last hundred years, it's been our vinery, and uh, we grow a muscat of Alexander within it in two beds. Um, we've we've got the greenhouse uh, divided into three sections. And the first, there's the first section, which is vinery, second section, which is vinery, and the third section, which is peach house. We also grow peaches in the case, uh, the conservative wall that uh, Mick mentioned earlier. Um, the vine itself is grown in raised beds, and these uh, supposedly are left from the orchid house. Um, supposedly they were full of water with boards on them, and the orchids were on top of that, so creating humidity. Um, but um, these were filled with soil and the vine is growing out of that. It's not a completely ideal scenario um, because it does um, lead to issues such as compaction, which also then leads to such issues as shanking of the grape. So we do have an, a few issues with that. So um, moving um, on to uh, a shot uh, within the greenhouse itself. And, here is a shot uh, mid-season showing the grapes beginning to fill out. Um, they've just uh, paused because they were stoning. Um, they don't really grow much as they're stoning, but uh, they've stoned now and they're just um, filling out. Okay, so um, this is a close-up of the grapes and uh, jobs at this stage are regular watering and damping down monitoring uh, pests and disease, for example, mildew, mealybug, red spider mite, and um, airflow is very important at this stage. Um, we've, we've got top air and side air on um, during the daytime, and that uh, helps as well with regard to diseases such as uh, mildew. I'm introducing predators at regular intervals possibly every three to four weeks. Um, for example, Cryptolemus and Spidex, um, which we obtain from a company called Coppert. So um, now um, here, here is a shot um, that's um, from around the beginning of March time. This shows the end vinery ready to go. So back in December, the, the uh, vine was pruned um, to two buds. Obviously, when it was dormant, we induced dormancy by um, letting the frost in. Um, so the next job after it's pruned is um, vine scraping, which is a very tedious job indeed, which takes seven or eight uh, weeks in order to do so with uh, myself and my colleague and um, volunteers as well. And um, essentially all the loose bark is um, scraped off the every inch of the vine. And um, this is because you get such pests as mealybug and uh, red spider mite underneath uh, eggs, et cetera. And once this is done, we, we paint the entire vine with SB plant invigorator, which uh, hopefully knocks off um, some of the pests as well. Um, soil change is done at this point where we take um, eight wheelbarrows of soil off and then put eight wheelbarrows back on. And uh, we're using a sort of like a John Innes uh, number three mix to which uh, I add a barrow of leaf mold and uh, half a sack of uh, charcoal, dried blood, seaweed and osmocoat. And um, so um, th th at, that, at this point as well, once that's done, we start on the raffia work and then um, and um, raffia um, is, comes right up, and um, and we can uh, you, we can um, attach all of the shoots to this and everything. The heat is um, put on in the end vinery on the first of March, but um, I have actually done it a week later this year, and might well do so every year from now on because I'm trying to. Uh, to make the crop a little bit later as well, especially with the uh, grape show being in October, which is quite a, a long way. Um, with the uh, middle vinery, um, I'd be switching it on a month later. Um, so, um, 
soon soon after it's been switched on, um, probably three weeks later, um, you get epicormic growth on all of the spurs, um, masses and masses of growth. And so we reduce this to um, three growths per spur, choosing obviously the best flowers. If there's no flowers at all, we'd, we, you still have to have some uh, shoots and we can use those for, um, uh, you know, to, to block the sun, etc. And um, so uh, once, once, that, once um, that's done and everything, we would um, stop the um, shoots two leaves after the flower. And obviously all of the, the, the buds um, on the leaf axles would start to, to, to go once you've um, stopped it. And uh, we would remove any um, buds that are opposite the flower or below the flower. And, um, and so um, we would let the buds that we, uh, the, the, in the axles of the growth that we've left, the two, the two buds go and keep stopping those. And so you have one leaf extensions coming off that and that hopefully pushes the, the um, power of the uh, vine into the grapes. Um, so the flowers will, um, will develop and, um, and on warm days we pollinate them really by shaking the rods. That's um, all that um, you need to do. And when the fr fruit is the size of a pea, we'd actually um, get our scissors out and another tedious job um, is removing 40% of all of the fruit. And um, we, we're after about a pencil width in between fruit. And, um, and essentially trying to create a heart-shaped um, bunch of grapes with shoulders. And we, we start off removing this, uh, the, the weaker fruit in growing, et cetera. So um, if, we, if we go on to, um, we'll, we'll skip that video and go on to the show um, boards. And um, so this is um, for the RHS late autumn fruit and veg show um, at Hyde Hall in Essex. And, um, and we have been doing this for a very, very long time. And, um, and we've got some good accolades, um, um, prizes in the process of, we don't just obviously enter the um, grapes, but we enter a, a wealth of other fruit as well from the um, kitchen gardens, but um, my, my remit is the grapes. And so we do a, a matching pair and we do a single bunch. And we always try to take an, an extra matching pair and an extra single bunch at least in case we have a calamity on the way over, um, which we've never had yet. Um, we, we tie each one on before the journey onto the hooks and, um, and then we have it at 45 degrees in a box so that it can't slip. And um, and so um, we, uh, we we're looking again for symmetry. We're looking for size, heart shape, of shoulders, and um, density um, of uh, the amount of berries in the bunch, uniformity of color. These are all things that we're looking for, and uh, and hopefully um, you know it's always a bit of a tense time and everything and. Uh, have some uh, quite quite a bit of competition these days, so it's it's very very important to us to show, and um, and the Duke and Duchess are very interested in it. They picked and displayed and taken down to the um, show on the same day. When I say on the same day, the show is the next day, but we do all the prep in, in one day. So um, there I am. <laughs> Not a very flattering photograph, um, but um, showing a first prize on a single bunch. Obviously, the, the matching pair is the one that is the is more difficult because trying to get a, a you know two that look the same that are of that quality is is quite difficult. Okay, so um, we're just uh, moving on now. We're just uh, going to talk a little bit about peaches. And so um, top, top left is the case, which is a Paxton glass house, which uh, has got peaches, predominantly peaches in the top section and an apricot as well. Um, but um, 
um, and um, on the uh, right hand top, um, there's some winter silhouettes of the um, the peaches as well, and the, these are after pruning. And um, so we prune about November time, and um, we are taking we're taking out um, the the old wood that has um, uh, that has flowered and fruited last year, and we're trying to um, to put uh, the the new wood on. And so we're or as much of the older wood as we can possibly take out is is, is taken out at that point, and. Um, so the varieties that we go, um, generally it's peregrine and um, and the new one that we've introduced uh, not so long ago is champion. And uh, that's a, a really nice, vigorous one, um, which, uh, as I say, we're, we're getting quite a bit of success with it. Um, these are all white peaches. Um, for some reason, I'm not quite sure what Mick might be able to explain that to me, but um, we, we always... Um, grow white peaches and it's expected of us to produce white peaches. So um, the flowers are pollinated with a rabbit tail on cane and um, and uh, this, this is really because of the fact that under glass there aren't many insects around at that point. Um, they're flowering now and they have been flowering for the last two weeks and, um, and so it's an everyday job and uh, we try to pollinate it by a you know, around 11 o'clock or onwards because the temperatures pick up and um, and we, we always consider that um, you get a better pollination if, if, the, if it's not too cold. So after pollination, the shoots are growing like mad and we do what's called fronting and backing um, where we're taking shoots out at front and back um, because, you know, if you're growing it as a fan on a wall or whatever, the, the, the the back shoots are going towards the glass and the front shoots are, are just going away. So we, we don't want those. And, uh, and then we would um, reduce um, the shoots further to three to five shoots, depending on the size of the stem. Um, as the fruit grows, we avoid uh, clusters of fruit if we can possibly help that. And as the peaches ripen, um, we, we stop watering because it does make them fall. And so, so that's um, just about all I have to say. Um, and I'll pass you back on to Nick. Okay, so so just, we're just going to move on. Kate, am I OK for a couple of minutes time wise? You are doing very well. Yes, I think a couple of minutes should be perfect. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of I'll race through this section. So what we really wanted to show there is we do look after some fruit that's that's highly valued by the family still um, and the fact that it goes to shows and wins awards is a and it's a, it's um it's been well looked after for centuries it's not only part of our heritage but it's also a great way of training gardeners um, it's a great way of adding an, an extra layer to the story of our heritage as well um but that's 50 percent of ian's working year so in terms of the cost, it's it's phenomenal. And if you then take into account how much it costs to heat the greenhouses and how much it costs to look after the fabric of a Victorian greenhouse, for 500 bunches of grapes and a few hundred peaches, it almost seems questionable whether we whether we should be doing it or not. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I just wanted to come on to other areas of production. So the team that we work with, the production team, we look after not only the indoor spaces, but outdoor spaces as well. And in 1994, to add to the Paxton glass houses for fruit growing in the gardens, um, the late Duke and Duchess, so this is this Duke's parents, built a three acre kitchen garden inside the walls of the, of the garden. So this is very much part of the garden. Um, with It had some old Victorian glasses houses there, but this was to grow fruit and veg and, primarily for the visitor experience. And what became quite apparent quite quickly is that two, two elderly people can't eat the, uh, the produce from a three acre garden. Um, and, and the visitors started to question, what do you do with all of that produce? And so we had a series of uh, quite young, but productive trained fruit trees um, that was 
we're, we're not only inexpensive in terms of looking after them, but actually to get people to pick the fruit and then do something with it was also a waste of results. So over, over time, um, some of the trained fruit in the kitchen garden started to wane for this reason. It wasn't getting used and it was expensive to look after. Luckily, the focus was kept on Ian's grapes and on peaches. Um, so we've got the glass houses. I just wanted to give you a, like, a few pictures so you can visually see what we're talking about in the gardens. This is what the, um, the kitchen garden produces now. And so there would have been a lot more trained fruit in there. There is still some trained fruit. We, we have apples, we have pears, we have figs, we have cherries, we have a whole series of currants. And like, as you would imagine, a, a stately home to have. But some of the um, some of the content, some of the more labour intensive content, has gone, and um, and it's um, even I suppose even more difficult to justify, given that this this is the extent of the gardens, and where a massive amount of reduce uh, resource was going was this is the kitchen garden and these are the glass houses. So up until recently, a disproportionate amount of our work was being put into growing these fruits for no real purpose, and I think that changed, and we, we've lost a lot of our trained fruit and also we don't have walled spaces so there seems to always be you know this this um tension between should we should we be putting our efforts into that type of produce or not and i suppose my role now currently is uh, this is a an, an example i like to use so currently my role is to really look at this because keeping trained fruit is very much part of the garden's heritage we think it's a really important skill set for all gardeners to acquire there's very few jobs like this where you do get so intimately connected to the plants that you're working with we think um these these fan cherries which are about 40 years old 30 40 years old are in a piece of the gardens that are not even open to the public and so we're constant uh, to be honest they produce cherries that are around about 25 pound or 30 euros per small box full so if we were to look at that as a um, as a monetary return, then there is a good reason to say we should start losing fruits like this. However, with the um, the, the the late Duke and Duchess, so this is the current Duke and Duchess. They're about to step down, and their son and daughter-in-law are about to enter residence. They have a very different view, and their their view is to how can we enrich the visiting experience? How can we make um, a bigger connection to to not only our our, our heritage but our, to our horticultural past and as a consequence they're setting up these education centers and they want to start putting some of this historic fabric back into the garden but only if we can justify the cost so as i was saying one of one of my roles at the moment is to look at ways of using our produce to build um, a story a narrative that um, that enriches the visitor experience that does bring back some commercial return it can be value as a way of training our volunteers and our and our future gardeners and with that i think there is a really good case now to start putting some more trained fruit more um, exciting trained fruit i think back into the gardens and so we're hoping to start planting in the next year or two a range of things that will be hopefully there for another 100 years like the grapes so i'm just going to leave, leave you with that uh, that's my Final comment. Thank you very much. And, and until we do, we've got some nice, helpful fruits just to uh, to take the place of these <laughs> lovely trained versions.